<laughs> my apologies. <laughs> But yes, as I was saying, this is an awesome team from HBM. We're talking about self implementation today, and it's going to be really exciting. A couple of just house cleaning tips before we begin. If you have a question, which I'm sure you will as we go through this session, feel free to put that question inside the Q&A section of the chat box, not the chat itself. We'll try to capture any questions that get in chat, of course, but it'll be easiest for us if we can do it through Q&A. Um, we're going to answer all questions that you guys have live at the very end after we kind of go through the HBM story and what they've learned through self-implementation. Um, and we look forward to really helping you guys uh, understand best practices, how to do it yourself, and what's required, and all other things with this. All right. Christina, before I begin, is there anything else you think we should mention? No, let's do introductions of our, our guests here today. Let's go forth, yes. So I'm going to start with you, Nick, since you are the leader of this amazing crew. Can you go ahead and introduce your team and just tell us a bit about what you guys do? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Gedney. I'm the VP of Operations for HBM, Heinz Building Maintenance. Uh, we're a regional facility management company on the West Coast, primarily in California right now. Uh, we specialize in facility management for schools and moving into churches and some other organizations. Uh, our company is about 20 years old and we are a growing business. And let's just go around a little bit. So David, let's start with you next. What do you do with HBM? Uh, currently, I'm a facilities director at uh, Urban School of San Francisco, um, but I also work directly with uh, the leadership team uh, with training and um, working with Nick as well as, as the team doing FCAs. Awesome. What about you, Michael? Uh, primarily, I am a facility director at Presentation High School in San Jose, California. Uh, but again, just like David, I'm on the facilities uh, condition team. And lastly, but definitely not least, Darren, what about you? Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Darren De La Torre. I'm a facilities director at College Prep School in Oakland. I uh, work with Nick and the team on uh, taking over this account. I took over this account for Nick, and uh, we implemented the Akita Box system here uh, when I got here, so in, in June or July. All right, cool. Thank you guys for introducing yourselves. My first question to you guys as a panel, and anyone can take this, is why was self-implementation the best route for you and your clients? So that's a good question. Um, we have gone through over the years with our clients, uh, we've gotten taken over accounts and we've been given what I call paperweights. Um, a third party will come in, they'll do a facilities condition assessment. Um, the administration had turned over and nobody had proper context or historical information to that, that FCA, um, and it was hard to update. Uh, what we found before we found a key to box was having our site managers or ourselves do the facility condition assessment best served our customers, right? Because um, while we were doing these assessments, we got our face and everything. We got familiar with all the systems and the conditions. Um, and so we had a process of doing it, but it was really long and hard to upkeep. I mean, just the pricing in itself and continually updating the inventory was difficult. So we, we found a keto box and we did a lot of vetting through different different systems and different tools and we immediately fell in love with it. Um, and really what we're finding is that we're giving our site managers and our executive leadership team the insight into all of our clients' facilities as we're going through these. So um, it's a good discovery process for us, um, and also it gives us transferable, transferable historical context uh, when we do this ourselves. Wonderful. Awesome. Um, another question for you guys, the team. How easy was it to self-implement with the Kita box? Like, how much ground did you guys were able to cover um, per person, per day? What kind of assets were you able to collect? Um, yeah, so again, another good question. I, I mean, I think first getting familiar with the system was key for us. Um, we didn't, I personally tried at first as going gung ho and, and trying it uh, by myself without getting familiar with the system. And we kind of had some lessons learned. Um, so I think that was kind of first and foremost. Um, but once we got familiar with the system, it became very easy. And we made sure to have 
pre-meetings. So we were all on the same page. We were all using the same formats and that really helped streamline the process. And if we've been going through this, the system has been improving. I mean, there's a text recognition feature where we're collecting asset information that makes this so much easier. So really getting familiar with the system was kind of paramount for us. Um, Darren has been doing this. He is the only manager director within HBM that's been doing this as the site director. Um, so his experience might be a little different than ours. So Darren, point to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, has been, what has been your experience with it? Um, what have you been able to collect? How fast has the process been to both learn the system, learn like all the tools inside of it? And then how fast has Oscar been to actually utilize it to collect what you need to collect? Uh, initially, we tried to go out into the field, collect all the data, come back to our desk uh, and input everything uh, at, on, through the desktop site. But we learned pretty quickly that we could input all of the assets uh, and all of the tagging through the app, you know, in real time on our phone. Uh, I did everything from my phone, you know, through the app, uh, about 80 hours, um, about two weeks for me personally, uh, because the team was going in a bunch of different directions. So I was able to take on this project uh, because I wanted all the information to, to be accurate. Uh, so I did it all myself in about 80 hours, two weeks, uh, around 11 buildings, 100,000 square feet, uh, really was able to take my time. Uh, just I, I took a bunch of pictures and I inputted them through the phone. Uh, when I was there on site, I would enter the asset, whether it be a fan coil unit or a fire extinguisher or an HVAC unit, a water heater. Took pictures of it, took pictures of all the serial numbers, added everything uh, through the app. And then when I came back to my desk at the end of the day, just verified and double checked that everything was was added in plan view and assigned to the proper spaces. But uh, once we got going with the system, it was it was really easy. And the ease of use through the app was, I mean, perfect. It, it flowed so well, so. I, I, to piggyback off that, I think uh, it's advantageous when you're, when you're doing it uh, with your clients or you have the ability to go back, right? Because sometimes we found, oh, you know what? We wanna capture X, Y, and Z um, and really take the time um, instead of just kind of getting through it a day or two, um, it allowed some more time to be a bit more thorough um, and really maybe assess um, after going back to the computer and seeing something going, oh, I want to go back to that. Actually, to that point, um, Nick, I think you worked with a team of three. It was you, David, and Michael doing I forget how many buildings it was and how many square footage it was, but did you guys actually have a lot of instances where you actually had to go back out to site be like and recollect something or collect a little more data on it, or were those kind of few and far in between? Um, for that particular site, there were few and far between, between, but we did use Google Earth for some of our data capturing for parking lots after we did general assessments, um, you know, measuring um, rooftops was much easier, especially because they were cedar shake and you can't really get up there and so we can get on ladders and kind of do a visual inspection of those. Um, so that particular site, no, but what we are finding success with is now that we've turned it over to our site manager, he's able to go back and add two um, O&M manuals into the, the assets. Um, there was a brand new HVAC that just got installed. So we went through the, you know, how we input that. So um, the team ourselves hasn't, but our site director is constantly going back in there um, and they'll be responsible for updating this in live time. I think we just gave that particular site um, a head start in the process, right? Because as, as Darren's kind of explaining, when you have day-to-day -day operations to deal with, you really got to designate time to this. Um, so um, yeah, I, I think ultimately, It'll be few far between that the team has to go back. We'll really be relying at the site director level to to go back and, and make those adjustments. That uh, that's a really good point to point out, right? Like you have to make time to set aside to really get this done correctly because data integrity at the first level is so important for it. Um, let me actually ask you guys. What was the strategy that you devised, especially for when you work with you know, a three-person team? Like Darren, you're amazing doing it all by yourself and you know, of course 100,000 square feet. But how did you guys actually strategize um different, you know, different with the work 
between different people? Um, were there particular assets that you prioritized over other assets? Um, anything. Michael, you want to talk to this one? Well, we prioritized um, mainly mechanical HVAC systems, fire life safety systems. Um, those were what we hit first. Um, hold on, some pop up just came on my screen here. A poll just popped up. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but as far as uh, splitting up the workflow, we as a team, um, once we agreed on our uh, common language to use designating equipment, we just split up the buildings geographically and um, each of us took a chunk and worked concurrently. And we were all on site at the same time, so we were able to ask each other if we had problems in real time and just went from there. It was pretty smooth. And we were doing wall finishes, floor finishes, ceiling finishes. So I think separating, you know, um, I took uh, mechanical rooms and electrical rooms uh, for the majority, and then the others were doing finishes and any MEP that was in those rooms. Um, so we kind of split up as well um, asset types or assessment types um, as best you can in a building, right? It's never going to be 100% the same room for room. One of the nice things about that app as well is that uh, when, when you have remodels done in the building, uh, we were able to make those changes directly, you know, just drawing them in um, with with measurements. And then we hand them over to you guys uh, to finish those off, which was nice because a lot of the times we get these old blueprints that aren't up to date. So we kind of have to, in, you know, input information as we go. And uh, that just was so nice to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, actually, can you guys talk about a little bit? Um, I think you just mentioned basically the markup tool that you're saying here, like you actually mark different places. Was that able to be used concurrently while you're on site? Yes, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it, yeah, it was. And um, one of the sites we did, uh, we had good, you know, the, the building structure floor plan was was accurate, but the interior walls weren't. So we had to redraw like half of it. And it, it can be a little time consuming, but again, the value in having actual as built now uh, of what the floor plans look to us was well worth the time that it took because record keeping at this site um, just historically had not been very good. So it was nice to get everything up to date. And also, can you speak a little bit about um, the naming conventions? Because I feel like, if I recall correctly, you guys had a really cool approach to that. Oh, yeah. Michael. Yeah, it's Michael. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, we just went with the list of standard um, naming conventions for equipment from a key box, and we added a few extras, and then we just came up with a common nomenclature. So we would have, you know, the equipment code and then a building code and then a number. So, you know, it worked out well, but it, we got on the same page beforehand. So we were using the same language for all the buildings. So all the data is accurate when you pull it up in the system. And we had ran into some problems because a lot of rooms had numbers. A lot of rooms did not. So we had to come up with a common language to actually name the rooms. Yeah. I think it's also important too, when you're doing, uh, you know, say fire extinguishers or you're doing life safety, then there's multiple of them. Um, we can then split the building up so that we're not repeating the same numbers, right? Um, like they, if something's a copy and paste, you could very easily have all of a sudden, you know, uh, five fire extinguisher fives. That does make sense. And I think, Darren, actually, you were mentioning that you kind of ran the same problem where one of the reasons why you had to always check your data when you got back on to offsite was because you were doing a lot of copies of assets. Can you speak to that a little bit, what the challenge around that was? Uh, yeah, I mean, first of all, the cut and paste option is amazing. I mean, that helped us go through if you have to do 300 fire extinguishers the cut and paste option is the only way you're going to get through it with your sanity intact. So at the end of it, you just have to go back, pull a lottery, pick one. Uh, Cause a lot of times when you make the copy, it says copy of that fire extinguisher and it'll copy all that information, including the pictures. So you have to change that uh, to the actual name of the fire extinguisher uh, that you're creating the asset for, and then delete uh, the pictures from the other fire extinguisher and add your new pictures. So 
Um, that part, I don't really perceive that part to be tedious because once you get in the flow of it, it, it runs pretty quickly, but you just have to make sure that you stay cognizant of it or you'll have 30 fire extinguishers that are all the same. Yeah. Definitely. Um, what are some other challenges you guys had on site that you could speak to? I, I think we had different approaches. I mean, ultimately the cell phone we found worked really well, but we, you know, we went through different approaches of how to log the information. Um, we started off wanting to get make model and, and some data entry in um, as we were doing it on site and then kind of going through it really found that taking pictures um, and then just uploading as much as we could and then any you know significant findings into the notes was going to be the quickest way for us. Um, for me, that, that was the biggest one was really just finding kind of uh, how to do it thoroughly, um, but also get enough information that, and not take too much time. And also, mm -hmm. go ahead. For us, uh, for uh, the CPS account, I was able to do it during the summer months. So there were no teachers or faculty or staff here, or students, which helped. We could take our, I could take my time, go into the classrooms, really take my time. I could see a challenge if you were trying to do it during the school year, because there's always people here, even on the weekends. And, you know, you can't be in a classroom doing asset collection while kids are in there trying to learn. So, uh, I mean, if you implemented this process at somewhere, uh, you know, and you had to do all the data collection, you would have, you would need a two or three week period of nobody or of a vacant property to to really manage it correctly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Michael or David, any challenges you encountered that you want to mention? Well, I mean, the way I, you know, I didn't use my phone, <laughs> so which I learned later, that's probably the best idea. But what I did do is, I mean, I, I took pictures with the phone uh, and then I was using the laptop. So I just transferred everything over. But I think the the ultimate way to go is is a, a, a tablet if you can. Um, it just seems like the, the easiest way. But I felt like the process was was relatively smooth um, as far as uh, once you get going. Um, you just get into this flow and um and the copy and paste works extremely well i mean yeah i i, I found it to be every time we do it it just gets easier and easier yep. yeah i found that using the phone for pictures worked well for me because um i just take a lot of pictures so then i had, can go back to them for reference and then i prefer to use a phone and a laptop together because using a tablet i hate typing things on a tablet that just doesn't work for me. So if I've got the computer, I can do all my typing real fast and then I can bring photos over from my phone. It's a lot easier that way. Yeah. Awesome. Let me uh, get away from the actual on-site process. Let's talk about the off-site process. What do you guys do with the data after you've collected all of this? Because you guys get the data at a really granular, awesome level. Why is that important to you? So I think prior experience costing, um, you know, when you get out to to forecasting or replacing or be able to make recommendations, a, lo a lot of the systems we've dealt with in the past will be uh, lighting or HVAC or roofing, and it's kind of a blanket assembly. You know, you're not getting down to a single ply PVC roofing, uh, which is something we can get in, in Akita Box in our asset collection. Uh, and that makes a big difference for us. Um, the ability to to capture um, items within the assembly is is another huge facet that uh, has a big implication on on cost. Um, so all of it comes down to is you know how accurate do you want to be? Um, in our experience, um, some of these blanket assembly systems that we've used tend to be anywhere from twenty to thirty percent, you know, plus or minus on costing. Um, so that to, to me personally is just a huge benefit and a huge value to take the extra time to really get that granular. Um, and, and like, you know, and you, and you said, it's only as good as the data we input. So it does take a quite a bit of research, uh, unless, unless you just know every building system assembly inside and out, uh, there's definitely stuff we ran across and it's like, oh, I don't know what that is, but we're going to find out. And we were able to match it up in a key to box and get you know fairly close or exactly what it was. Um, and for us, that goes a long way. Nick's favorite word, granular. 
No, it was, it, you know, so I've, I've worked with other companies in the past that do um, building audits. And um, it's funny because as soon as they're done doing the audit, uh, I'm sitting with my CFO and we're changing all the numbers. Um, you know, so being able to do it uh, with boots on the ground and guys that that are in the building and actually kind of get a better understanding of, of what we have to, to work with, um, the maintenance that's being done on the equipment allows us to give you more realistic numbers. Yeah. I actually have a quick question. Um, so this forecasting you're talking about, are you using an Akita box tool or is that something you're doing outside of Akita box? Uh, we're using the Akita box tool. Okay, the capital management. Capital management, yes. Awesome. Yeah, and having the capital management, having the RS means data in the system natively yes. makes things so much easier. So you don't have to go through industry um, estimates and, you know, kind of come up with the correct numbers that the numbers are already there for you yeah yeah and you're you're able to add a uh, scope to the assembly you know you can put flashing replacement with within a roof assembly which isn't something you can typically do and, and like michael said having the the um national estimated useful life already plugged in all the information is is just beautiful and and to Dave's point, when we do our assessments, you're looking at environmental factors and maintenance factors. And so you can adjust the estimated useful life. It's not just stuck on that number, uh, which is a really nice feature. Awesome, awesome. Um, let me ask you guys, if you were to expand your operations to like a non-school, um, like let's say a technology company that doesn't have any breaks in its schedule, how would you devise your strategy around that? What kind of team would you assemble? Um, and what would you, what would you be your priorities when choosing different people? And how would you also like, you know, time it out? Uh, nighttime hours, I think would work best. Two weeks on a graveyard shift with uh a quality manager that, that knows his or her stuff and maybe two other people that that are ready to learn or that have a good working knowledge of mechanical systems or you know internal operations of a building maybe that'll work that type of uh, agenda yeah awesome. plus plus also maximizing the amount of remote data collection you can do on site so have the team get as much data as quickly as possible and then get out and then do the actual data entry and analysis offsite so it doesn't interfere with their day-to-day -day operations. Yeah. Really good suggestions, nice. Um, and also I think uh, Darren, maybe you mentioned this earlier, but the data integrity would like, how would you choose somebody who really Break respects the data? I'm sorry, what? Uh, that's a great question. And we've probably all worked where companies before where they come up to you, they give you a iPad here, go collect the data and you bring it back to them and you could care less what's what what you input it. If you give it to like a frontline person that doesn't want to do that job anyway, then I mean, it's almost like a, you know, th there's no point to that system at all. So for this particular uh, implementation of the Akita box system over the HBM portfolio, Nick came on site uh, he trained me. Um, he made sure that that I was the right person to go collect the data. And then once he felt good, and I'm sure he did that with all his other sites, once we felt okay that we were good, that this was going to work, that then we implemented the process. But uh, that's the most important part of it, the, the actual human that you choose to go collect the data. That's the most integral part of this entire process. And without that, I mean, there's no point in even doing it, right? Absolutely. <laughs> If you don't intend to do it right the first time, then you're going to just be in a world of hurt later on anyways. Yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah, they choose the right tool for the job. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I think picking, you know, making sure people really see the value in what you're doing, because it is a time consuming process. Um, and, and you do have to do a good amount of research and, and be able to allocate the proper time, uh, making sure that they really care and they're really buying into what, what you're doing. And, and this team right here, I mean, just hats off to them. They're absolutely incredible and a reason they're on the FCA team. 
uh, in the HBM leadership team, um, because uh, without, without people that really buy into this, it's like David Darren said, you know, it's just, it's going to be extremely difficult to get valuable information. So. My last question to you guys probably will be around: How do you plan to maintain the upkeep of this data? You know, as thing as new things get added into the system, and also just uh, as new things happen. You know, especially when you're in California, there's all kinds of disasters going on all the time. So <laughs> what's your approach there? I, I, I think there's two different approaches. And um, so I, I think one is the FCA team comes in and we do the initial bulk bulk haul, and then we hand it off to, to the site director or manager. Um, and that's what we're doing over at Congregation Beth Om right now. Uh, and we're actually meeting weekly right now until we, we really feel comfortable that this is going to be that living, breathing database of, of facilities um, information. Um, and, and we pass it off. Uh, I think Darren, and I'll let him speak to him. I mean, he's doing that one himself. So this is going to be a constant, right? It's, it's constantly got to be within your purview of this needs to be maintained. Yeah, you got to you you got to keep up on it because it, you didn't want to make sure it's beneficial to the client. So they continue they they want to keep it. Yeah. Yeah, and updating condition assessment should really be part of your ongoing preventative maintenance program anyway. So if you're doing PMs on uh, systems, you update the conditions at the same time, it just becomes a whole living process. Yeah, the PMs uh, that we've been putting into the system for the assets, uh, they update uh, the asset in real time. So if there's a service request or a work order for that asset, everything attaches to that asset. Or if somebody wrote something on the PM, hey, this might need some work in a month or so, or we found this, everything is related to that asset. And then that adjusts the, the scale of deferred maintenance or, or maintenance in the future for that asset in, in real time. So if you went back to it a month later, it might show something different based on your PM program. And from there, you would be able to know, like I can hand this off to another manager and I wouldn't have to tell them anything. All they would have to do was pull up the asset they wanted to pull up and they could see the historical data of it and see what they needed to where where they were at, you know, for the future of of that particular asset. Yeah. yeah, definitely making sure that they everyone is aware and using the the condition, uh, mm -hmm. the ability to rate and change the condition of that asset when they do their PMs too is is integral, right? Because that gives you uh, that boots on the ground feel or um, knowledge of, of that current condition. Because they, again, our whole philosophy in, in doing this internally is that we don't want this just to turn into a paperweight. Um, so we got to make sure our teams are properly trained in, in that we're doing that and showing continual value, just not that singular snapshot in time. I'd like to speak as well to the, to the mapping on that, uh, on that system is uh, such a, a, a great add-on. I, I, over here, we're at this school. We've we've had to do all the mapping ourselves and create these. You know, basically these they're kind of rudimentary, and we send them out. But to have that and able to pass out to everybody, and then you know, you know obviously you change users. Um, some are admins, and just some are regular. But people can look through that and know where uh, fire extinguishers are and shutoffs uh, during emergencies. Because we do have an ICS team over here that you know they they look at that. Awesome, awesome. Um, a question I saw on the Q&A channel actually is, you mentioned you need some dedicated time to get in and out. Do you have any suggestions or tips on how to get leadership, the managers at the actual sites, to give you the space and time to do this correctly? That's a really good question. I mean, I think they've got to see the value, right? Um, unless you're doing it on off hours in your own time, we've got to get buy-in from the leadership to be able to stop an area of operations to be able to do this, or we've got to be okay with doing the assessment while operations are going on. Um, in a school, obviously it's very hard to do it while children are in class or they're out in the play areas. Um, you know, if you were in an office environment, if there is a, a notification going out or if there is a, um, a conference going on, you know, trying to find pockets of time that you could schedule around might be the best time. Uh, but again, this is going to come down to leadership buying and the value 
uh, to disrupt operations if it is on operating hours. And how do you typically convince them? Like, do you bring reports with you? Do you let them know like, hey, here's what you typically see in the field going on and here's what a key box can do instead, how quickly it can happen? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. Just like, is there any like, like what concrete strategies do you use to actually convince them to give you that time? How do you create that buy-in? Typically we're going in and there's a, you know, we're, we're not brought in when the facility conditions are good. Um, we're brought in when there's heavy deferred maintenance and, and they really need a, a expert. Um, so we'll do an initial kind of discovery process of, hey, this is at a snapshot of what your facilities look like. We really need to be able to go in depth to tell you the extent and the full scope of, of what's going on with your facilities. Um, and I think just the initial point of, of getting into the areas that most people don't see, you know, they, they don't go into the water closets, they don't go on top of the roof. You, you start to get that buy-in because they can actually see an image to something they don't see that's going to impact finances. Um, so doing a quick evaluation to give a snapshot and an explanation of why we need to go in further detail. All right. Jessica, do we have any other questions from the Q&A or? Uh, let's see. Um, so you talked about implementing PMs a little bit. Um, can you talk about your approach to um, your PM strategy, like how you choose what to add in there um, as far as preventive maintenance? So we have a basic uh, HBM approved PM program uh, that's uh, has been approved uh, by Nick and is uh, overlaid over all the accounts. So in, in that regard, our PM program is pretty cookie cutter. But uh, after we implement all of those PMs, HVAC PMs, fire extinguisher PMs, uh, you know, Door Creek PMs, it, you anything like that, you know, flush your toilets, all that good stuff. Uh, if we needed to add any other PMs uh, at our, that are specific to our site, then um, as the as the director, we can add those and they'll be specific to, to that site only. As long as they don't take away uh, too much bandwidth from the team, because the PM program that HBM already has set up, um, and that's about a year's worth of work for a five or six person team. So you start adding PMs on top of that, they can kind of, their cues can kind of get clogged up. But uh, basically, you know, we have our general PMs that we we put over each account, and if we ha have to add anything else, then we can do that, you know, with it, it, if it has minimal impact to the team. Yeah, I, I think determining where the value to in, you know, because your PM it can come up as a singular asset, or you can do it to a building, right? Um, so if you're doing fire extinguisher checks, is there value in your text doing? A, a work order for each fire extinguisher when you've got 30 in a building. Um, you know, so that kind of thing will assign to a building. Um, your HVAC, you want that historical data, right, for each singular, singular unit. So there is value in doing a single one to a single asset. Um, so I think it's just looking at where the value and the historical information um, on the assets that you're doing those PMs. Awesome, great answers, great answers. Um... Great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and just call one last time for our, our people who are attending. If you have any other questions you want to ask, feel free to put them in right now. My only other question really is, can you tell us maybe like a ballpark figure? How much time do you think using the Akita Boxes capture app, using Akita Boxes technology has saved you with these supplementations um, compared to what you guys were doing before? Well, Michael, you just did one. You probably have a good comparison. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I, I'm I, just finishing up a condition assessment on my current site, which with, without using the Kita box, and it's not, it is not fun. No, it's, it's taking me months and months. And at other schools, I've done it using um, just an Excel spreadsheet. And that took me so long. I mean, that took me six months at least. And it was so long that by the time I got done, I had to go back and redo the first parts of it because the conditions had gotten even worse. So <laughs> using a Kita box is a far superior solution. <laughs> Yeah, speaking to that, Nick and I did that, did, did one of this with, with Excel. Um, we spent two days on site, probably close to 10 hour days each time. And then what felt like probably another 
80 hours of data uh, being put in. Um, so yeah, the Akita box was so much nicer. Yeah, I, I, I had a stack of industry estimating books that I was using to create the cost projections. Right. And just, <laughs> felt like I was doing a term paper in college for six months straight. It was no fun. Yeah. Yeah, I think just to, to key on the same thing, I mean, I've done them in Excel or other systems. Um, and uh, I don't know, at least 50, if not 75% faster than, than doing it any other way. Uh, the last time I did one in Excel at a site by myself, it like Michael said, it took me six months to do it. Uh, so, and this, we're, we're turning them around. I mean, Darren did it at a site in, in two weeks. Yeah, I just want to underscore again, one person, two weeks, 80 hours, 100,000 plus square feet. What? 11 buildings, what? <laughs> it's amazing, Darren. It's one quarter of the time that it's taken me with other programs uh, in the past. So. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. Jessica, did we get any other Q&As? No, I think you guys answered most people's questions and really I learned a lot. So thank you guys so much for sharing um, everything with us today. Yeah, definitely. Thank you guys for being so amazing and coming on to this. I love, I literally love working with you guys. You guys are an amazing team. So hope to do this again in the future. Let's circle back in about I don't know, like maybe six months or so and see how all the other sites have been implemented and what you guys have learned throughout, you know, now, you know, that much more of the process. Um, but yeah. And for anybody who's still watching, if you guys are interested in doing Capture App or doing any kind of self-implementation of your own, you know, whether it's a new building you guys have or a model building you have, just a whole slew of new assets you want to put into the system, we are here to help as your customer success management team. Feel free to reach out to any of us, um, in particular CSMs, for more information on the Capture App and on self-implementation be uh, sorry, best practices. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much for coming today, guys. Have a Thank great you guys day. Thank so much for having us. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Take care.